Chapter 14, Part 2 of The Scouts of Stonewall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Packard of Western Colorado. The Scouts of Stonewall by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter 14 The Double Battle. Part 2. Morning found them motionless in the forest, over the caves. They ate a hasty breakfast and waited. But the scouts were all out, and presently Harry and Dalton were sent toward the Shenandoah. Finding nothing there, they crossed over the bridge and came to Ewell's division, where they had plenty of acquaintances. The sun was now high, and while they were talking with their friends, they heard the faint report of rifle shots far in their front. Presently the scouts came running back and said that the enemy was only two miles away and was advancing to the attack. Ewell took off his hat, and his bald head glistened in the sun's rays. But like Jackson, he was always cool, and he calmly moved his troops into position along a low ridge, with heavy woods on either flank. Harry knew this ground, alas, too well. It was among the trees just behind the ridge that Turner Ashby had been slain. Ewell had before him Fremont with two to one, and the rest of the army under Jackson's immediate command was four miles away facing shields. Do you hear anything behind you, Harry? asked Dalton. No, why do you ask? If we heard the booming of guns, we'd hear them at four miles. We'd know that General Jackson himself was engaged. But as there's no sound, Shields hasn't come up, and we'll wait here a while to see if we can't have something important to report. I don't think so, said Harry. We know that the enemy is about to attack here in full force, and that's enough to know about this side of the river. We ought to gallop back to General Jackson and tell him. You're right, Harry, said the Virginian, in whom the sense of duty was strong. The general may be attacked by the time we get there, and he'll want to know exactly how things are. They galloped back as fast as they could, and found that General Jackson had moved his headquarters to the little village of Port Republic. They found him, and told him the news as he was mounting his horse. But at the same time, an excited and breathless messenger came galloping up from another direction. The vanguard of Shields had already routed his pickets, and the second northern army was pressing forward in full force. As he spoke, the northern cavalry came in sight, and if those northern horsemen had known what a prize was almost within their hands, they would have spared no exertion. "'Make for the bridge! Make for the bridge, General!' cried Dalton. The horsemen in blue were not coming fast. They rode cautiously through the streets. Southern villages were not friendly to them, and this caution saved Stonewall Jackson. He was on his horse in an instant, galloping for the bridge, and Harry and Dalton were hot behind him. They thundered over the bridge with the northern cavalry just at their heels, and escaped by a hair's breadth. But the chief of artillery and Dr. McGuire and one of the captains, Willis, were captured, and the rest of the staff was dispersed. "'My God!' exclaimed Harry, when the northern cavalry stopped at the bridge. "'What an escape!' He was thinking of Jackson's escape, not his own. And while he was wondering what the general would do, he saw him ride to the bank of the river and watch the northern cavalry on the other side. Then Harry and Dalton uttered a shout as they saw a southern battery push forward from the village and open on the cavalry. An infantry regiment, which had been forming in the town, also came up at full speed, uttering the long, high-pitched rebel yell. The northern vanguard, which had come so near to such a high achievement, was driven back with a rush, and a southern battery appearing on its flank swept it with shell as it retreated. So heavy was the southern attack that the infantry also were driven back and their guns taken. The entire vanguard was routed, and as it received no support, even Harry and Dalton knew that the main army under shields had not yet come up. That was the closest shave I ever saw, said Dalton. So it was, said Harry. But just listen to that noise behind you. A tremendous roar and crash told them that the battle between Ewell and Fremont had opened. Jackson beckoned to Harry, Dalton, and the members of his staff who were reassembled. 
The three who were captured subsequently escaped in the confusion and turmoil and rejoined their general. Setting a powerful force to guard the bridge, Jackson said to his staff, While we are waiting for Shields to come up with his army, we'll ride over and see how the affair between Ewell and Fremont is coming on. The roar and crash told them that it was coming on with great violence. But Fremont, so strong in pursuit, was not so strong in action. Now that he was face to face with the enemy, he did not attack with all his might. He hesitated, not from personal fear, but from fear on account of his army. The whole force of Jackson might be in front of him, and the apprehensions that he did not feel in pursuit assailed him when he looked at the ridge covered with the enemy. Harry and Dalton watched with breathless interest. A portion of Fremont's army, but not all of it, just when it was needed most, was sent to the charge. Led by the pickets and the skirmishers, they came forward gallantly, a long line of glittering bayonets. In the thick woods on their flank lay three southern regiments, ambushed and not yet stirring. No sunlight penetrated there to show their danger to the soldiers who were breasting the slope. Harry foresaw all, and he drew a long breath for brave men who were marching to a certain fate. Why don't they look? Why don't they look? He found himself exclaiming. The next instant the entire wood burst into flame. Picking their aim and firing at short range, the southern riflemen sent sheet after sheet of bullets into the charging ranks. It was more than human blood and flesh could stand, and the northern regiments gave way. But it was not a rout. They retreated on their reserves and stood there recovering themselves, while southern riflemen reloaded, but did not pursue. The regiments which had done the deadly work sank back into the woods, and seemingly the battle was over. Harry had not been under fire. He and Dalton, the rest of Jackson's staff, and the general himself merely watched, nor did Jackson give any further orders to his able Lieutenant Ewell. He allowed him to make the battle his own, and in Harry's opinion he was making it right. There came a silence that seemed interminably long to Harry. The sunlight blazed down, and the two armies stood looking at each other across a field that was strewn with the fallen. It would have been folly for the men in blue to charge again, and it was the chief business of the southern troops to hold them back. Therefore they stood in their positions and watched. Harry judged that the bulk of Fremont's army was not yet up. It was this failure to bring superior numbers to bear at the right time that was always the ruin of the northern generals in the valley, because the genius on the other side invariably saw the mistake and profited by it. Harry and Dalton still waited, wondering. Jackson himself sat quietly on his horse and issued no order. The northern troops were motionless, and Harry, who knew how precious time was, with the rest of Fremont's army coming up, wondered again. But Trimble, the commander of the southern riflemen, hidden in the wood, saw a chance. He would send his men under the cover of the forest and hurl them suddenly upon the northern flank. Ewell gave his consent and said that he would charge too if the movement was successful. Harry, watching, saw the southern regiments in the wood steal from the forest, pass swiftly up the ravine, and then, delivering a shattering fire at short range, charge with bayonet upon the northern flank. The men in blue, surprised by so fierce an onset, gave way. Uttering the rebel yell, the southerners followed and pushed them further and further. Ewell's quick eye, noting the success, sent forward his own center in a heavy charge. Fremont, from the rear, hurried forward new troops, but they were beaten as fast as they arrived. The batteries were compelled to unlimber and take to flight. The fresh brigade dispatched by Fremont was routed, and the whole southern line pressed forward, driving the northern army before it. General Jackson was wise and trust in General Ewell, said Dalton to Harry. He's won a notable victory. I wonder how far he'll push it. Not far, I think. All Ewell's got to do is hold Fremont, and he has surely held him. Their shield on the other side of the river with whom we have to deal. But you know, George, that all the time we've been sitting here watching this battle in front of us, I've been afraid we'd hear the booming of the guns from the other side of the river telling that Shields was up. We scorched their faces so badly here at Cross Keys that they must be hesitating. Lord, Harry, how old Stonewall plays with fire. 
To attack and defeat one army, and then with the other only a few miles away, must take nerves all of steel. But if Yule keeps on following Fremont, he'll be too far away when we turn to deal with shields. But he won't go too far. There are the trumpets now recalling the army. The mellow notes were calling in eager riflemen, who wished to continue the pursuit. But the army was not to retire. It held the battlefield, and now that the twilight was coming, the men began to build their fires, which blazed through the night within sight of those of the enemy. The sentinels of the two armies were within speaking distance of one another, and often in the dark, as happened after many other battle in this war, Yank and Reb passed a friendly word or two. They met two on the field, where they carried away their dead and wounded, but on such errands there was always peace. Those hours of the night were precious, but Fremont did not use them. Defeated, he held back, magnifying the numbers of his enemy, fearing that Jackson was in front of him with his whole army, and once more out of touch with his allies' shields. But Stonewall Jackson was all activity. The great warlike intellect was working with the utmost precision and speed. Having beaten back Fremont, he was making ready for shields. The first part of the drama, as he had planned it, had been carried through with brilliant success, and he meant that the next should be its equal. Harry was not off his horse that night. He carried message after message to generals and colonels and captains. He saw the main portion of Ewell's army withdrawn from Fremont's front, leaving only a single brigade to hold him, in case he should advance at dawn. But he saw the fires increased, and he carried orders that the men should build them high and see that they did not go down. When he came back from one of these errands about midnight, just after the rise of the moon, he found General Jackson standing upon the bank of the river, giving minute directions to a swarm of officers. His mind missed nothing. He directed not only the movement of the troops, but he saw also that the trains of ammunition and food were sent to the proper points. About halfway between midnight and morning he laid down and slept in a small house near the river bank. Shortly before dawn, the commanders of a battery, looking for one of its officers, entered the house and saw Jackson, dressed for the saddle, sword, boots, spurs, and all, laying on his face upon the bed asleep. On a small table near him stood a short piece of tallow candle, sputtering dimly. But the officer saw that it was Jackson, and he turned on tiptoe to withdraw. The general awoke instantly, sat up and demanded who was there. When the officer explained, he said he was glad that he had been awakened, asked about the disposition of the troops, and gave further commands he did not go to sleep again. But Harry's orders carried him far beyond midnight, and he had no thought of sleep. Once more, repressed but intense excitement had complete hold of him. He could not have slept had the chance been given to him. The bulk of the army was now in front of shields, and the pickets were not only in touch, but were skirmishing actively. All through the late hours after midnight, Harry heard the flash of their firing in front of him. The cavalry, under Sherburne and other daring leaders, were exchanging shots with the equally daring cavalry of the enemy. As the dawn approached, the firing was heavier. Harry knew that the day would witness a great battle, and his heart was filled with anxiety. The army, led by shields, showed signs of greater energy and tenacity than that led by Fremont. The northern troops that had fought so fiercely at Kernstown were there, and they also had leaders who would not be daunted by doubts and numbers. Harry wondered if they had heard of the defeat of Fremont at Cross Keys. He looked at the flashing of the rifles in the dusk, and before dawn rode back to the house where his commander slept. He was ready and waiting when Jackson came forth, and Dalton, appearing from somewhere in the dusk, sat silently on his horse by his side. The general with his staff at once rode toward the front, and the masses of the southern army also swung forward. Harry saw that, according to Jackson's custom, they would attack, not wait for it. It was yet dusky, but the firing in their front was increasing in intensity. There was a steady crash, and a blaze of light from the rifle muzzles ran through the forest. He took an order to the Acadians to move forward behind the two batteries, and as he came back he passed the Invincibles, now merely a skeleton regiment, but advancing in perfect order, the two colonels on their flanks near the head. He also saw St. Clair and Langdon, but he had time only to wave his hand to them as he galloped back to Jackson. The dusk rapidly grew thinner. 
Then the burnished sun rose over the hills, and Harry saw the northern army before him, spread across a level between the river and a spur of the blue bridge, and also on the slopes and in the woods. A heavy battery crowned one of the hills, another was posted in the forest, and there were more guns between. Harry saw that the position was strong, and he noted with amazement that the northern forces did not seem to outnumber Jackson's. It was evident that Shields, with the majority of his force, was not yet up. He glanced at Jackson. He knew that the fact could not have escaped the general, but he saw no trace of exultation on his face. There was another fact that Harry did not then know. Nearly all the men who had fought successfully against Jackson at Kernstown were in that vanguard, and Tyler, who had deemed himself a victor there, commanded them. Everybody else had been beaten by Stonewall Jackson, but not they. Confident of victory, they asked to be led against the southern army, and they felt only joy when the rising sunlight disclosed their foe. They were the men of Ohio and West Virginia again, staunch and sturdy. Harry knew instinctively that the battle would be fierce, pushed to the utmost. Jackson had no other choice, and as the sunlight spread over the valley, although the mountains were yet in mist, the cannon on the flanks opened with a tremendous discharge, followed by crash after crash, north and south replying to each other. A southern column also marched along the slope of the hills in order to take Tyler's men in flank. Harry looked eagerly to see the northern troops give way, but they held fast. The veterans of Ohio and West Virginia refused to give ground, and Winder, who led the southern column, could make no progress. Harry watched with bated breath and a feeling of alarm. Were they to lose after such splendid plans and such unparalleled exertions? The sun, rising higher, poured down a flood of golden beams driving the mists from the mountains, and disclosing the plain and slopes below wrapped in fire, shot through with the gleam of steel from the bayonets. Tyler, who commanded the northern vanguard, proved himself here, as at Kernstown, a brave and worthy foe. He too had eyes to see and a brain to think. Seeing that his Ohio and West Virginia men were standing fast against every attack made by Winder, he hurried fresh troops to their aid, that they might attack in return. The battle thickened fast. At the point of contact along the slopes and in the woods, there was a continued roar of cannon and rifles. Enemies came face to face, and the men of Jackson, victorious on so many fields, were slowly pressed back. A shout of triumph rose from the Union lines, and the eager Tyler brought yet more troops into action. Two of Ewell's battalions heard the thunder of the battle and rushed of their own accord to the relief of their commander, but they were unable to stem the fury of Ohio and West Virginia, and they were borne back with the others. Hearing as it roared in their ears that cry of victory from their foe, which they had so often compelled that foe himself to hear, but it was more bitter to none than to Harry. Sitting on his horse in the rear, he saw in the blazing sunlight everything that passed. He saw for the first time in many days the men in gray yielding. The incredible was happening. After beating Fremont, after all their superb tactics, they were now losing to Shields. He looked at Jackson, hoping to receive some order that would take him into action, but the general said nothing. He was watching the battle, and his face was inscrutable. Harry wondered how he could preserve his calm while his troops were being beaten in front and the army of Fremont might thunder at any moment on his flank or rear. Truly the nerves that could remain steady in such moments must be made of steel triply wrought. The northern army, stronger and more resolute than ever, was coming on, a long blue line crested with bayonets. The northern cannon posted well and served with coolness and precision swept the southern ranks. The men in gray retreated faster, and some of their guns were taken. The Union troops charged upon them more fiercely than ever, and the regiments threatened to fall into panic. Then Jackson, shouting to his staff to follow, spurred forward into the mob and begged them to stand. He rode among them, striking some with the flat of his sword and encouraging others. His officers showed the same energy and courage. 
but the columns, losing cohesion, seemed on the point of dissolving in the face of an enemy who pressed them so hard. Harry uttered a groan, which nobody heard in all the crash and tumult. His heart sank like lead. Hope was gone, clean away. But at the very moment that hope departed, he heard a great cheer, followed a moment later by a terrific crash of rifles and cannon. Then he saw those blessed Acadians charging in the smoke along the slope. They had come through the woods, and they rushed directly upon the great northern battery posted there. But so well were those guns handled, and so fierce was their fire, that the Acadians were driven back. They returned to the charge, were driven back again, but coming on a third time, took all the battery except one gun. Then, with triumphant shouts, they turned them on their late owners. The whole southern line seemed to recover itself at once. The remainder of Ewell's troops reached the field and enabled their comrades to turn and attack. The Stonewall Brigade in the center, where Jackson was, returned to the charge. In a few minutes, fickle fortune had faced about completely. The Union men sought victory once more snatched from their hands. Their columns in the plain were being raked by powerful batteries on the flank, many of the guns having recently been theirs. They must retreat or be destroyed. The brave and skillful Tyler reluctantly gave the order to retreat. And when Harry saw the blue line go back, he shouted with joy. Then the rebel yell, thrilling, vast, and triumphant, swelled along the whole line, which lifted up itself and rushed at the enemy, the cavalry charging fiercely on the flanks. Shields got up fresh troops, but it was too late. The men in gray were pouring forward, victorious at every point, and sweeping everything before them, while the army of Fremont, arriving at the river at noon, saw burned bridges, the terrible battlefield on the other side, strewn with the fallen, and the southern legions thundering northward in pursuit of the second army, superior in numbers to their own, that they had defeated in two days. Every pulse in Harry beat with excitement. His soul sprang up at once from the depths to the stars. This, when hope seemed wholly gone, was the crowning and culminating victory. The achievement of Jackson equaled anything of which he had ever heard. And while the army of Fremont was held fast on the other side of the river, the second army under Shields, beaten in its turn, was retreating at a headlong rate down the valley. The veterans of Kernstown had fought magnificently, but they had been outgeneraled, and, like all the others, had gone down in defeat before Jackson. Jackson, merciless alike in battle and pursuit, pushed hard after the men in blue for nine or ten miles down the river, capturing cannon and prisoners. The Ohio and West Virginia men began at last to reform again, and night coming on, Jackson stopped the pursuit. He still could not afford to go too far down the valley, lest the remains of Fremont's army appear in his rear. As they went back in the night, Harry and Dalton talked together in low tones. Jackson was just ahead of them, riding Little Sorrel, silent, his shoulders stooped a little his mind apparently having passed on from the problems of the day, which were solved, to those of the morrow, which were to be solved. He replied only with a smile to the members of his staff who congratulated him now upon this his extraordinary achievement, surpassing anything that he had done hitherto in the valley. For Harry and Dalton, young hero worshippers, he had assumed a stature yet greater, in their boyish eyes, he was the man who did the impossible over and over again. The great martial brain was still at work. Having won two fresh victories in two days, and having paralyzed the operations of his enemies, Jackson was preparing for other bewildering movements. Harry and Dalton, and all the other members of the staff, were riding forth presently in the dusk with the orders for the different brigades and regiments to concentrate at Brown's Gap in the mountains, from which point Jackson could march to the attack of McClellan before Richmond. 
or return to deal blows at his opponents in the valley as he pleased. But whichever he choose, McDowell and 60,000 men would not be present at the fight for Richmond. Jackson, with his little army, had hurled back the Union right, and the two Union armies could not be united in time. The whole Southern army was gathered at midnight in Brown's Gap, and the men who had eaten but little and slept but little in forty-eight hours, and who had fought two fierce and victorious battles in that time, throwing themselves upon the ground, slept like dead men. While they slept, consternation was spreading in the north. Lincoln, ever hopeful and never yielding, had believed that Jackson was in disorderly flight up the valley, and so had his Secretary of War, Stanton. The fact that this fleeing force had turned suddenly and beaten both Fremont and Shields, each of whom had superior forces, was unbelievable, but it was true. But Lincoln and the North recalled their courage and turned hopeful eyes toward McClellan. End of chapter 14, part 2. Recording by Michael Packard of Western Colorado.